Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're going down the rabbit hole, baby. That's right, we're gonna take a look at Israel, Arab history, a short overview of the region. I don't know a harder one to try to wrap our heads around, but I do know whether you're a kid in high school, you're in college, or you're a lifelong learner, you gotta be cray cray not to be interested in world history. So here we go, I can hear it at the door. Learning, it's here. Before we get started guys, I want to just emphasize kind of the controversial nature of this video lecture. And I'm really going to try to walk the line, Johnny Cash baby, try to give you both sides of the coin, but really try to stay non-biased, trying to show you through neutral lens kind of the historical roots of this crisis that's ever growing. Here we go. All right, let's take a look at geography before we go back in time 4,000 years. Um, and if you take a look at the geography of Israel, Palestine, you can see it's a small slither of land. We're only talking about a couple hundred miles, um, and it's definitely way on the western edge of the Middle East. Eastern Africa is right there, and of course, Egypt, um, northeastern Africa. Um, Israel and Egypt are separated by the Red Sea, and you can see the Mediterranean is right there, so Israel has ports that can go anywhere in Europe. But surrounding Israel, you can see uh, we have Lebanon and Syria. Um, Iraq isn't that far off. Jordan touches its border. Egypt, like we mentioned before. And way down on the southeast edge of Israel, you know, they're not far from Saudi Arabia. So Israel, which is a Jewish homeland, we're going to talk about that in a moment, is surrounded by Muslim nations. So let's take a look at a short history of kind of the land of Israel and then we'll uh, jump into the 20th century head first. All right, in terms of the history of Israel, we definitely want to start kind of in biblical times and without getting religious or atheist on you through the lens here, you know, the concept of the story is, is that Jacob and the children of Israel were given the land of Israel by God himself and gave it to those guys. And then because of famine, they were forced out across to Egypt. And for four generations, Jacob and the children of Israel became slaves in Egypt. And then eventually, the great-great-grandson, maybe I'm off a great, um, Moses of Jacob, led the Jews across the Red Sea, that's the splitting of the water kind of deal, and ending up back in Israel where they belong, where were 2,000 years they reign in the kingdom of Israel. It's the, kind of the storyline. So the Jews have that historical root to the land of Israel. And then around the time of Christ, the story is that the Romans sweep in. And then after that, we can go through a whole bunch of sweep-ins. But the Jews really aren't going to control the land um, you know, until we get into the 20th century. In fact, it's going to be the Arabs around 635 um, in the Common Era. The Arabs are going to take that over, and the Ottomans are going to kind of put their foot down around 1516. And for the next 400, what, 60, 70 years, that land that is known as Israel, and in some circles called Palestine, which has historical roots as well, the name Palestine, is going to be held by Muslims, by Islamic empires, by Arabs. You also want to keep in mind that Jerusalem in the center of Israel is kind of, you know, big fashionable city for three major religions. Not only does Judaism have a claim to it, of course, we've already talked about that um, with, you know, Jacob and the children of Israel, um, but we also have Christians with Christ kind of traveling through there in Bethlehem and that being the Holy Land, but Muslims as well in the Holy Book, their Quran. They claim that God gave it to Ishmael, who was one of the sons of Abraham. So they have religious connections as well. So you can take that, you know, for what it's worth, but all three religions have their finger in that land somewhere. Zionism, that's the word that you want to hook your teeth into. Zionism is a word that's been around a long time, but basically what it means is that if you're a Jewish Zionist, you believe that that land of Israel was given to the Jews and that's where you belong. And there's even Christian Zionists who believe that if the Jews aren't in the land of Israel, then the Bible's not being fulfilled and that the second coming of Christ will never occur. So uh, Zionist is kind of this religious extreme belief, or, or you can literal belief, that the Jews should be in Israel. So at the end of the 1800s, we have a cat by the name of Theodore Herzl, who is um, running a Jewish state newspaper. And in it, he writes an article, a paper called The State of the Jews, where for the first time he really calls for action, that Jews need to band together, and they need to pressure their governments, and they need a homeland. But Zionism and true Zionism is seeking out that land to fulfill biblical prophecy. 
And in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, you do have mass immigration, um, tens of thousands of Jews that are leaving Africa, other Arab nations, leaving Europe, and when the Nazis are going to come in, that number is going to go even up higher, and really kind of doing, you know, um, a, a flee to this land and this Zionist movement. And for the most part, these are very traditional Jews that are first going there. They believe in the Bible, and they believe they need to be there. There's only one problem. There's people there already. So World War I is going to be a game changer. Um, up to World War I, as we previously mentioned, it's the Ottoman Empire, the Arabs that are controlling that land. But as World War I rolls in, they make a bad choice aligning themselves with the Central Powers. Wah, wah, wah. Bad choice. The British are going to come in and they're actually going to find Arab allies. This is where the, uh, the story of Lawrence of Arabia comes from. And they're going to fight the Ottoman Empire and defeat them. Um, and then the British are going to put their big fat foot in that land. Um, and they're going to claim a mandate over that land. They're going to control it until the end of World War II. But at this point, the British are going to adopt the position in something called the Balfour Declaration which was in a letter from the uh, foreign minister of Great Britain um, to the Rothschild, the banking lord, the Baron Rothschild, who was a British Zionist, that the British were going to support the creation of a Jewish state. They didn't say it would be Israel yet, but they made that declaration in 1917. I'm not exactly why they did it. Um, there are theorists that believe that this is the same time that the United States is kind of jumping into World War I and maybe to curry favor with the Wilson administration. Woodrow Wilson had some Zionists that were very close to him in his presidential cabinet, and there are historians that have claimed that this could have been a move really to uh, make a stronger alliance with the United States. But whatever it is, um, now that Zionism has been kind of put on a priority list by the British, um, Jews are going to start to flock to that area. And uh, Jewish numbers start popping up in the tens of thousands in Tel Aviv um, from World War I to World War II. And that doesn't mean that there wasn't resistance. We're not going to go too deep under the covers, but in the 1920s, there are incidences of uh, terrorism. There's an organization called the Black Hand, I believe in the early 1930s, that begins in Syria. It's basically a terrorist operation to root out these outsiders or Jewish settlers who they see as invaders. They see as, this is my land, and you've come and you're trying to take my land. And you've made it your mission in Zionism. It's like a biblical call-out. So that begins really early in the 1930s, as I previously mentioned. Um, um, but here we go. Now that World War I is over and Jews are flocking there, um, all we need is another war and we can clear this bad boy off soon enough. Of course, World War II is going to bring a new layer to this because of the Holocaust um, and the rooting out of the Jewish populations and the extermination of six million Jews in Europe. Um, so the Zionists are going to be able to, I think, um, have a stronger argument that there needs to be a land for Jews because of what Hitler did, because of uh, them not having a place to go. So, um, attention turns to the United Nations. And in 1947, um, the United Nations votes Resolution 181 um, that gives that land or pieces of that land of Palestine to the Jewish people in a new state called Israel. And then on May 14th, 1948, um, the British mandate ends in Israel. In a sense, the British take their hands off it. And on the same day, the state of Israel is born. And now we're off to the races because now you have a Jewish state in the middle of bang, bang, Arab nations. And Arab nations aren't gonna like it very much. So let's get on to the wars. Lots of wars, lots of wars. So the day the state of Israel is born is the first war, the Arab-Israeli war. And this is a combination of countries, Egypt and Syria, Jordan and Iraq, that are going to declare war on Israel. They don't want to put up with it. Um, and they believe that they have kind of, you know, the argument of self-determination, which is in the United Nations Charter, that the people of this land should decide, and outsiders have given this land to people who haven't been here for 2,000 years. So they're going to attack Israel, Israel's going to attack back, and Israel's going to mad win. And every time that I mention a war, you'll watch the border here. You can see that the borders are going to shift. Um, and then from 1948 to 1950. 
1953, you have over 700,000 Jews that are flocking to Israel. Most of them from Europe. These are refugees from World War II, but also from other Arab nations. I mean, at this point, if you're a Jew in Arab land, you better get the heck out. And if you're an Arab in the state of Israel in Jewish land, many of them, they got the heck out. And once you got the heck out, you weren't allowed back in. And many, many refugees are going to be created from this problem, including the um, issue of Palestinian refugees who were living in that land, who fleed to fight Israel, and now they can't get back home. Um, but in 1956, Egypt is going to take the extraordinary step of shutting down or nationalizing the Suez Canal, which is big shipping lanes that's going to cut Israel off. And because of that, the British and the French and the Israeli are going to rally back. And after they nationalize the Suez Canal, Israel, they're not going to put up with that. Nobody messes with the Israelis. They're going to team up with the British and the French. They're going to get control back through the military of that Sinai Peninsula that runs the Suez Canal. And every time, what happens? Bloop, bloop, bloop. Their land gets a little bit bigger. So now in 1964, a group is going to form that's going to represent what it says is the interest of these people they're calling Palestinians that had occupied that land, that had fleed, and that want their control of their land back, especially on the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank. So the PLO, their first mission, destroy Israel. How's that for a starting point? And of course, uh, Israel at this point is going to have its uh, heightened alerts up because it's been attacked before. <laughs> In 1967, we have even another war. This is Egypt and Jordan that are going to team up. I think Egypt's a little kind of PO'd about the Suez Canal and the Sinai Peninsula. They're going to team up, and as they're teaming up, Israel's going to whack them. And Israel's going to take even more land, the Golan Heights, parts of the West Bank, a little bit of the Gaza Strip. And at this point, I think many of the Palestinians and the Arabs really turn to more of a radical approach of terrorism. In 1972, um, Arab nationalists, Palestinian terrorists, um, are going to kill Israeli athletes at the 1972 Munich Olympics. Um, incredible. And then in 1973, um, the Arabs again attack. It's called the Yom Kippur War, the most holy day on the Jewish calendar. And it took three days for Israel kind of get its act together. And uh, of course, with the United States aid, we're going to talk about the United States in a moment, um, they're going to be able to repel the Arab attack. But it was at that point that the Soviet Union um, was going to jump in. We really had in 1973 kind of one of these chess moves on the Cold War board that almost blew up into nuclear war. Um, eventually the two sides both back down. And then we have big change. So now that's kind of the end of the big wars. We're still going to have terrorism, but we want to talk about how the United States plays a part and how it's going to be kind of an instigator and at the same time a peacemaker. So this is where it gets a little bit more controversial and hard to talk about because you don't want to be political. So we're going to state some obvious facts. Without a doubt, the United States is the biggest supplier of Israeli with weapons and financial aid. In fact, there's no other country on earth, the United States, in the history of our republic, has given more money to than Israel. And the reason for that might be part Zionist, as we've talked about before, but it also has roots in the idea that um, whatever you want to say about the situation, Israel you know, has voting as a democracy, has rights. And now the comments are going to fly. And with that, I will say that without a doubt, Israel is there, not because of the self-determination of the people of that land, but by, in a sense, outsiders of the United Nations. So I can see how the people that live there, the Arabs and the Palestinians, see this as imperialism and occupation. Two sides to every coin, maybe even three sides. But now the United States, who's definitely standing on one side of the scale, is going to come in as the peace broker. So without getting too you know, far under the layers again, and you're going to have to do your own research if you're writing big papers, um, we can definitely talk about 1979 Camp David Accord. We have Jimmy Carter, who historians you know, will, will slam for being a weak and American president, but he's the first guy to get a deal. For the first time, one of those Arab nations, Egypt, strikes a deal by recognizing Israel. They get their Sinai Peninsula back, and they agree to have open waterways, so they make their peace with Israel. In 1993, it's Bill Clinton, um, a Democratic president who gets the two sides in Oslo. Um, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat kind of strike a tentative deal that's supposed to eventually give the land of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip to a new independent country of Palestine. And um, that was the deal in 93. Since then, um, it's really devolved into chaos. 
Not only is the Israel is kind of occupying that land, but they're building on land that has been in Oslo was supposed to go to on the Palestinians. And at the same time, the Palestinians who promised to turn away from use of terrorism have been doing that, have been increasing that. Um, in fact, electing a group called Hamas, who's a, a known terrorist group in the Middle East, to represent them in the Gaza Strip. So Israel has its dukes up. Um, for the last 20 years, the Arab nationalists and the Palestinians have had their dukes up, and I don't think anybody knows how to get back out of that rabbit hole. But that, in a sense, is the story of Israel. So you definitely can understand both sides at this point, and you can understand why it's so controversial, and why, in a sense, everything that we talk about, when we talk about Osama bin Laden, or terrorism, or Al-Qaeda, or um, many of the world's ills, boils down to that tension between the Jews and the state of Israel and the surrounding Arab nations. So there you go, giddy up for the learning. I hope you got something out of it. I skipped like a million things, so you should go read a million things. What are you doing watching so many videos anyway? Because it's fun, that's why Mr. Hughes, or because your teacher made you. But either way, if you haven't subscribed, what the hey, what are you doing? That's not nice. You should click my face and you'll zip off. We have like 200 and we have like a million videos. There's more than a million videos. Why wouldn't you do that? So there you go, guys. Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time. We do the teaching on the YouTubes. You see that? Now it's, it's kung fu. That's why.